channel, and as you know, we're talking about women in politics, covering women in politics. Um, delighted to have all of our panelists here, which I will let Kay uh, introduce everybody. Uh, we're, we're going to be tweeting tonight using the hashtag, She's Running. And I just want to say that if you're unfamiliar with WAM, if you want to learn more about WAM and not currently a member, please visit our Facebook page or contact one of us. Um, we're all going to be tweeting, so you can find us that way, too, if you're on Twitter. And um, I think that's about it. I'm going to hand this over to Kay. Kay. Thank you so much, Soraya. Wow, it's a little loud. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, I want to try to keep the conversation going, but um, I'll just briefly introduce each of our panelists. We're here tonight to talk about uh, media coverage of women running for office. Um, and to my right here is Sabrina Siddiqui, um, a politics reporter at the Huffington Post. Um, to her right is Jennifer Boisco, who ran for uh, Virginia's 86th district. Um, and to her right is Erin um, Erin Luz Cataro? Luz Cataro. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, who is with She Should Run, um, who, whose primary objective is to encourage more women to run for office and to talk about the structural barriers for women running for office. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, to start off with, I'd love to hear from each of you about two specific examples. Um, one where you thought um, media coverage of a female candidate um, was really great, um, and maybe one where it was not so great. Um, so if you want to start. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here this evening. Um, I'm going to start with a not so great first, if that's okay. And I know it seems sort of obvious to bring up Hillary Clinton, but I feel like this will be relevant once again very soon as we look ahead at 2016, and you're already starting to see front cover stories like Planet Hillary on the New York Times Magazine raise questions about why, whether or not a man would ever be at the receiving end of, of such a cover piece. And when you go back to 2008, I think that there was not necessarily a great deal of sexism in the reporting so much as there was in the commentary. But we know that in elections, commentary can play a, a, a great amount of influence or have a great amount of influence in viewers who are sitting at home watching all of these networks on television. And I just kind of wanted to re resurrect some of the examples. She was called a she-devil who only got as far as she did because her husband had messed around. Another pundit had said that whenever I see her, whenever she comes on stage, I involuntarily cross my legs. And another comment was she was looking like every man's first wife standing outside of a probate court. So this was, and this is on national TV, this is the sort of MSNBC, CNN, Fox, panels where everyone kind of sits around and talks about debates and such. Uh, I think we might see tolerance to a little lesser degree because at the time, you know, there was a primary between her and Barack Obama and some of those attacks came from liberals. They came from Democrats and because they wanted to see Obama seal the nomination. So there might be less tolerance um, in addition to how the media has slowly tried to catch up with the way it portrays women candidates is, since that time. Um, and then in terms of a Better example, I do think by the 2012 election you saw some change, uh, not as much as we'd like to see, but I think Senator Tammy Baldwin, um, ran, who ran, of course, in Wisconsin, uh, was fairly, I, I think people, the media was fair, and, and she was fairly well portrayed by the media in terms of focusing on the issues. Of course, there was a lot of focus on how she would become the first openly gay senator in this country's history. Um, but, but by and large, there was not a, a, a very sexist narrative to that coverage. And then, you know, simultaneous to that, uh, Tammy Duckworth, who ran for Congress for the House in Illinois, whose campaign I covered. She's an Iraq War veteran, um, very strong on military issues, on disabilities. And, and people really picked up on her story as she lost both her legs in combat. She's a very strong woman, and I think that there was very little tolerance when her opponent tried to make fun of how she's were more worried about what outfit she would pick instead of what she would debate um, in front of him. So I think those are some good and bad examples, and I'll let the others share. Thanks for having us. I'm looking forward to talking with you all tonight. I actually chose two, uh, two different reports on the same issue, and I went back to 2010. Um, Crystal Ball was running as a Democrat in the Virginia's first district. She um, was in her 20s, and in, 
Republican bloggers found some pictures that she had taken with her husband at a party. The way that it was portrayed in the media um, is, is pretty stark, actually. The positive, the more positive coverage was by a woman, believe it or not. Her name was Shellen Davis. And um, she, she was reporting on the fact that the Republican bloggers had posted the private photos of, of her and that it's a se sexist tactic meant to divert attention from the issues. She didn't go into any detail about exactly what was in the photos. She just talked about um, Miss. Um, Ms. Ball's response to it, saying, this is unfair, you wouldn't see this with a man. In fact, um, Scott Brown had posed nude in a magazine, and nobody made a big deal about that. So that's one, one response. Um, and then just days later, a gentleman with NBC News started his article on the same topic, saying, it seems that six years ago, candidate for Congress Crystal Ball failed to see how her reindeer games would affect her future. And then he went on to say, risque pictures of the 29-year-old business owner, blah, 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 um, had been published on several blogs. The pictures show Ball in a Santa hat and otherwise dressed provocatively, leading her ex-husband dressed as Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, but with a sex toy for a nose on a leash and in lewd poses. There was no need for him to continue to share the information about what was in the pictures. It continued, it continued to put her in a bad light and continued to marginalize her. She, however, I was really proud, said she fought back. She said, you know what, this has nothing to do with anything that I'm talking about public policy. This, doesn't, this has nothing to do with whether or not I am a good legislator or could be a good leader. And she said, in fact, Anyone who treats women like this is wrong. And she said, women should stand up even if this happens to you in the future. Do not stop, do not see to this, but continue to speak out and stand up. And you young women, don't let this bully you. You get up and you stand proudly for who you are. This is the wrong thing to do. And then she continued to talk about the issues that were important to her. So I was very proud of the way she responded. Um, but I think the stark difference between what uh, Mr. Stab Matthew Stabley did in, in continuing to per portray what the bloggers had tried to do versus what Ms. Davis did is pretty stark. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be here this evening. I think such a, an important piece of the topic tonight is just coming together in discussion to talk about ways that we, um, we, can, we can work together to advance women into positions of leadership. And one of, those, um, one of those key factors when you look at this through the lens of women advancing into, into powers of position in government is in fact, the barrier that exists of how women are covered by the media. And um, I love, Jennifer, that you shared the example of Crystal Ball because um, she was actually someone who was the first, uh, the first to use research that she should run joint forces with Women's Media Center um, on, a, on a project called Name It, Change It, which I know many of you are familiar with. Um, we had released, we had just released, I mean, hot off the press, the research really showing that, you know, right in the face of conventional wisdom that advising, uh, political advisors had been advising for, um, for, for, for um, as long as anyone any, anyone had been advising women to just av avoid um, calling out instances of sexism or drawing attention to them. Um, and in this case of Crystal Ball and these photos being released, um, she was in a tricky spot because she, she, by talking about the photos, was in fact drawing attention to the photos. And, and her political advisors um, weren't necessarily on board with this newly released um, research saying that if women do call out sexism that they face on the campaign trail, that not only um, do they make up the, the ground that they lost because of the sexist remarks, but they get a little bump for standing up for themselves. Um, and it, and so she was the first one to sort of take this research and say, and it's just who she is too, and say, hell no, I'm not, you know, I'm not okay with this. I'm not okay with 
um, you know, this, me being a young woman running for office, being what I'm known for. So uh, we were really proud of her to see her do, to, to, to call that out. And I think she um, really blazed a trail um, right after the research was released. And, you know, in the, in, the, in the joint work that we do with Women's Media Center, because we are very much focused on um, the instances that we see of sexism that women are facing, um, we see lots of them. So uh, they, you know, they're brought to atten our attention regularly. And you know, most recently, we we conducted an update of the research that focused on appearance, and um, you know, very specifically about the coverage that women. Um, women face when uh, 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 articles come out about um, what they're wearing as opposed to who they are and their qualifications. And um, the research clearly shows that it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative or neutral coverage, that it's damaging to women. Um, and it's t I know this is tough, and I know this is going to be part of the, I think, really interesting conversation that we have tonight. So I, um, I would just say we see, these, we see these instances regularly, everything on the appearance front from, you know, most recently, Wendy Davis. We've, we've seen so many articles about, about Wendy, um, and, you know, one recently in the New York Times uh, uh, pointing to her fitted black dress and her high heels. Um, and, and, and it was just uh, strangely placed as well. Um, some of you may know Val Demings, who recently ran for Congress um, and is in another, uh, another political race. The Orlando Weekly, uh, in, in coverage of, of her race, pointed out her formal red dress and her pearl ensemble. Um, so again, we just see example and example, example after um, uh, of, of women's appearance being covered. And I would say on the positive note, very quickly, we love, love to see any of the coverage that makes the case for why women are effective in office. One of my favorite recent headlines, actually a Huffington Post article, um, men got us into this shutdown and women got us out. Um, it, it's, it's very helpful to articulate the case for needing more women in office. Sorry about that. Um, I, I'd like to take a second to talk about, I think, what a lot of candidates uh, have maybe experienced, um, that maybe the mommy trap, as it's sometimes called. Um, women running for office um, you know, can talk about their role as a mother. It can be very humanizing. Um, you know, it, it makes them seem like they have a, a family and a great relationship with their families. Um, but it can also um, evoke a lot of stereotypes about you know how the women's role is with the family and as a and the women's role is as a mother um, you know i think a lot of the debate around uh, wendy davis's um, biography um, sort of fell into this trap um, you know when is it legitimate to question details about a candidate's um, biography which you know can be um, you know a non-sexist um, way to cover it cover um, an issue but when it fell into conservative bloggers talking about, you know, was she abandoning her children to pursue a career and, and evoking a lot of those stereotypes. Um, I also remember in 2012 the talk about um, stay-at-home moms, um, you know, Ann Romney giving the shout out, I love you women. Um, things like that really evoked, um, uh, you know, and I think really made people react very strongly um, because these are very deeply held um, stereotypes. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, want to defend, you know, if they know of somebody who is who is a stay-at-home um, mom in their life, they want to defend that. Um, so I, I just wanted to maybe throw this question out to the panel. Um, you know, when, when is it, um, when is it positive? When it when is coverage of a candidate's family is positive, and when does it fall into those traps? Um, and maybe I can start with you, Sabrina. Okay. Um, well, first, and I think with the with the so-called mommy trap, um, it kind of depends. A lot of it, I think, falls on the media less so than the candidate and how they perceive uh, that angle. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these women will have children and. If anything, the goal is to encourage them to run even though they have children, especially young children. And I think when they have models like a Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, for example, who does have, uh, her, whose children are young uh, and certainly have not grown up at this point, they, they can see that they're, they're 
is a possibility to pursue the sort of career that she has and then to still be an effective parent. And she does often talk about her children. It, 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 if the media decides instead to take that angle that they did with Wendy Davis and start asking questions about how present someone was or whether someone prioritized career over children and was that a bad thing, then that's where it's perceived as negative and we, we've seen it as you said, with Wendy Davis, where I thought it was actually okay to question the accuracy so long as they were sticking to the point that her she built a campaign around these facts and the story. Does it correspond? And if it doesn't, does she have a reason as to why there are some inaccuracies, which she later admitted to and said she has to be a little more careful with the details, uh, but the flip side is there's no excuse, of course, then for the other narrative that emerges, which is the, the sugar daddy narrative that we heard about, that you know her second husband paid for her to go to Harvard and had the kids at home, and that was it was as though she abandoned them. Her daughters had to come out and write a letter defending their own mom, and uh, you know it, it's bizarre that we would say that a woman should be faulted because she chose higher, to pursue higher education, much less in a very rigorous program where it wouldn't have made sense to take her children with her. Um, so, you know, I think so long as it can be turned into a positive and I, I, there is a responsibility within the media to stick to that, I think people who run effective campaigns are able to turn it on its head too and say, hey, look, you know, I'm, I, I have young children and they can kind of turn it into that's why I'm doing what I'm doing in the first place. It's for, you'll often hear, this is, I think about my children when I'm pushing for this legislation. Or so, did yeah. you? I just wanted to follow up on the the Gillibrand piece of that. Um, you know, she there were a number of profiles about Kristen Gillib or sorry Kirsten Gillibrand um, in the last year, um, and I think every single one of them mentioned her small children. Um, and I think that's both an upside and a downside. Like you were saying, you know, it, on one hand, it's really great. It's a great example of how, um, you know we can see women who with small children running for office you know part of me was like you go you bring that five-year-old into Harry Reid's office and you you show him exactly what it's like to be a, a working mom um, but on the other hand I, I was kind of by the fourth or fifth profile that mentioned it, I was kind of like really are we are we still really on that um so Aaron if you wanted to jump in on that I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts do I have you I do okay great um, Here's what I would say about it. I think that uh, this is a real challenge from the perspective of a candidate. Um, uh, female candidates face challenges that are are absolutely unique, um, and and there's a real uh, there's a real double standard that exists for um, for women as, as candidates. So you know, often candidate uh, often women are asked about you know articles are led about their 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 parenting or non parenting or they're single not married. What does that mean? There's all of these questions that exist for women and this traditional stereotype that is deemed acceptable to um, you know to the majority of population. And I think that. Um, and, and Kirsten does a really good job of this, that often it's it's just pushing back a little bit in, in the interview, if it's possible, from the candidate perspective, to say, um, you know, to, to push back to the point of if it's if it's a you know piece on her qualifications, her her background, to try to stick to that as much as possible. But Kirsten, I think, is a good example of somebody who leads with that too. She leads with, you know, it's fair game, I feel like, if you're if you yourself are gonna talk about this and the importance of it and talk about that you bring a unique perspective to the table because of who you are as a mother, um, it's just finding that careful, careful balance that that isn't the story alone. Um, so, so I think that's the important thing. I, I agree with we, what you all are saying. Um, I just ran for office this past year, and I have two daughters who are teenagers. Um, and my daughters and I talked about this a whole lot. In fact, my my younger daughter, who, Sophie Clear, who's 16, was saying, "You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't." Women who don't have children are deemed as soulless, and they don't care about children. But if darn it, if you're a mom, then you know why aren't you at home taking care of your kids? And and I had the full support of my family. My husband made sacrifices to make sure that he covered things when I was not able to be there. Um, and you don't hear this much when we're talking about men. There's only one woman in the General Assembly that I'm aware of who is a mother of school-aged children in Virginia. I would have been the second. Um, 
we are not enabling and empowering our women who have children to take those roles on because it, they make it too difficult for them. Um, I'm very fortunate to live in, Herndon, Virginia has a mayor who, who has two young kids, a, a daughter in um, kindergarten and a fourth grader. And my girls babysit for her when she's at the town council meetings so that she has coverage. We work to take care of each other and pull each other up instead of beating each other down. Um, I always took the, the attitude that being a mother gives me a perspective that is different than, than you know, a 70-year-old man. I'm living, you know, the PTA and working with my kids and making sure that the schools are as strong as they are. And I'm watching my children have to wake up and be on the bus at 6.15 and living those kinds of problems that everyday Americans and Virginians are living. I think that brings a specific perspective. Not too long ago, Blanche Lincoln, former senator from Arkansas, um, was speaking to a group of us, and she was talking about how when she was on the Hill, she could bring her personal experiences of having to juggle five different things to the floor and to talk about it, about why things were important, why daycare was important. So I do not allow that to be a handicap. My opponent, um, who ha has been in office for 12 years, used to always talk about the fact that I was unemployed. I um, stepped down from a job that I had to raise my children and was very active in my community in a variety of different ways so that I could focus on making sure that I was working towards uh, making my community better and taking care of my children, which I'm very proud of. Um, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to move on to something that Erin touched on a little bit earlier, um, talking about clothing. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to sort of uh, convene this panel, um, many months ago I had read an article um, in The Atlantic, um, Molly Ball made the case for writing, for making it okay for reporters to talk about uh, their clothing. Um, and I have mixed feelings about this, I'll tell you the truth. Um, you know, as, as a reporter and a writer, sometimes those details, you know, you make you feel um, like the, uh, a story can really sing. But um, I do understand that uh, there is some research out there that shows it can be really damaging to female candidates. Um, and of course, um, you know, there's the part of me that's like, I really love to talk about Rosa DeLora's awesome glasses, and I, I admire Nancy Pelosi's awesome power suits. Um, and I, it, there's that part of me that finds, you know, sort of like the mother thing that finds it um, inspirational. So um, I wanted to uh, maybe uh, kick it to both Sabrina and Erin, um, and if you had any examples about um, maybe if you had experienced coverage that focused on your clothing and how you felt about it, um, if folks could just jump in on that. Well, um, you know, I think sometimes it depends on the outlet. I mean, for us at the Huffington Post, of course there's a lot of fascination, for example, with what the First Lady wears. That's That kind of is something that I haven't necessarily found particular uh, criticism in. And, and she herself, of course, it also does, you know, certainly talk about this finding designers who aren't as heard of or helping American businesses and you know all the kind of lines that go along with what she does and I you know that's not something I take as much fault in but when I look at what I do on the hill and when I profile women who are either running for office or incumbents I personally have not found an appropriate time to talk about what they're wearing I recently profiled uh, Patty Murray the Senate Budget Committee chair and we, my colleague and I who wrote up this long profile just didn't deem it necessary to describe her suit and her outfit. We felt, you know, the story is about her role in resolving the shutdown and, and crafting this budget that's going to pass after, I think, five years. So it, we, it would just, I think, demean that conversation or distract from it. At the On the flip side, when I read about Kirsten Gillibrand in Vogue, I expect them to talk about what she's wearing. I think she expects them to talk about what she's wearing. In fact, she posed, she did an entire ed photo shoot for them. And, and to be fair, when they inter did the same for Rand Paul a few months later or weeks later, they also gave, he gave him the same treatment and described his outfit because that's what Vogue does. So maybe I, I think it depends on wh who's writing it. Is it a women's lifestyle magazine? Is that the kind of focus of this? then that, that, that's something that often happen, that comes with it. And if, if it's a political piece, if it's about the work this person is doing, then 
unless there's a real case to be made, unless that you feel they're making a statement with their outfit, like a power statement, um, and you find an appropriate place, then I tend to steer on the side of it, it, it's not relevant. Sure. So, um, what what I would say is, it's de I would I would agree with Sabrina that it's definitely a, to, uh, important to ask the question of is this relevant? Um, you know, I I am coming at this obviously through the lens of you know being very close to the research and my mission being advancing women in, in politics. Um, we know unequivocally that it hurts women to. Uh, to cover their appearance, appearance coverage. Again, I say it was a, a little shocking to us even that positive, neutral, negative, it doesn't matter. The appearance coverage damages women um, in, in, their, in their campaigns um, and how they're advancing. And I think it's important to remember um, that women are coming to the table um, when, when they're running for office already uh, uh, facing a, a higher hill to climb. Barbara Lee Family Foundation did some incredible research that, sh that um, proved once again what, what we already knew but we were hoping we had moved on from which is women are held to a higher level of a higher standard, a higher level need to, need to um, tout their qualifications in a way that men don't. They need to lead with their qualifications. So because of that, um, it, it, it's already, you sort of pair these two things together and it's just another another barrier that women are facing to advancing so I think that it's just important especially with so many of you in the room who um, who you know who are writing on uh, about about women in politics to know that that you know even the the best intentioned coverage can be damaging and to ask the very important question of is it relevant I was just gonna, I was just gonna say. Oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna add that um, that's a question I often ask of my own reporters: is if you're including this detail, why are you including it? Yeah, I think that's really important to think about. What is our bias? If we, you know, we all come to the table with a bias and an expectation of what we're going to see in a person, and when we when we challenge those, we can change what we're doing. Um, my friend Catherine Reed talked to me about this a, a couple of days ago, and she was saying, think of, think of the bias or the human mind as an operating system and a computer. The computer gives you information, but you don't think about how it gets there. You just know that it's doing it. Why don't we go back you know, and, and sit down and think about how do we come to these conclusions? Why are we focusing on um, what a woman looks like? You know, Poor Nan Whaley, who is the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, has been railed through the, I don't know if, obviously some of you are familiar with it. For those of you who don't know, um, she just did her state of the, the city address and was reamed for her eyebrows, for her makeup, for what she had on, and it, the Facebook blog just went off on her. Just, it, it, it's horrifying, it's horrifying to read the article. But back to, back to the, 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 the core of it is that we all have different ideas about what, what a person is going to be. Is it appropriate for a woman to be a leader? I don't know that everybody believes that. And we need our, our elected leaders, we need um, folks who are already in places of power to, to step out and mentor folks, to step out and question things, and to take up for folks so that we can move the ball forward. Um, Jennifer brought up a really good uh, a really good example with the mayor of Dayton, Dayton who recently uh, recently elected. So um, she had uh, a number of um, Facebook type, Twitter type um, uh, trolls who were calling out her appearance, um, just really nasty stuff. And um, and and a well intentioned writer. Um, a well-intentioned writer with the Dayton Daily News uh, came out and, and profiled this from the perspective of just how awful it was. Um, but unfortunately, by doing so, had now elevated um, the issue of her appearance and had, had, you know, took all of, like, here are all the photos that everybody's putting out there, um, you know, and, and how dare they, they say that this is awful, um, 
when, when and again, very well intentioned, um, and and the mayor did exactly what she should do, which is to come out really strong and to stand up and say, my appearance is not news, and get let's get back to business. Here are the things that matter to me, and pivoted right back to her talking points. It was a really, really strong response, and again, a well intentioned, I think, writer um, that just 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 made it made it worse for her. Absolutely. Um, and one thing I've noticed recently, and you know, as you know, 2016 is coming around the corner, um, I've already seen articles talking about Chris Christie's weight. And so I just wanted to ask as a quick question, um, you know, do you think it's fair to talk about um, a male candidate's weight um, if, they, if, if we say that's not okay for a female candidate? Well, I, I think that it's, it's a little tough sometimes to answer that question because I've seen the argument that is there a double standard and, you know, because this is around his presidential ambitions, there's, it's not simply a superficial question, it's a health question. If he's going to be president, is he healthy, is he fit? Um, you know that they release their physical results every year the White House has to so that the public is aware of what the president's health is. Um, and the Romney campaign too, when they were tapping him for, potentially tapping him and didn't for VP, they were very interested too in, in his health. There were, there were details revealed in that book doubled down about the 2012 race where they had nicknamed him Pufferfish and I think were very uh, curious about his health records. I mean, that was obviously in poor taste and kind of, you know, it depends on whether people are just deriding him uh, for no real purpose or if, if people want to know whether or not the person who might be president is in fact healthy. And, and it's tough because I, I don't know that there's been a woman in a similar position where I can draw an analogy and say, here was this woman who was running for president and people perceived her as being very overweight and then that became a part of the story. Um, I, I mean, I think that it would easily be criticized if tomorrow someone raised uh, this issue with a member of Congress who was a woman. Um, it almost reminds I mean, and I'll pass it on to the others since I know we're running short on time, but it, al it almost reminds me of also the age question where I think that that's something that often, you know, if you ask a man about his age, it's, it's, it's not deemed as offensive. You ask a woman, as Luke Russert uh, did to Nancy Pelosi, um, about leadership positions within the Democratic uh, caucus, it was, there was an outrage. And I think he actually had a legitimate question about House Democrats as a whole being all three leaders um, above the age of 70 and when are they gonna pass on the baton, he picked the absolute wrong moment to ask that question when it was only Nancy Pelosi surrounded by a bunch of women and not Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer. Um, you know, that would have been a better moment and Clyburn, of course. Uh, so, so, so that's kind of what it reminds me of. I think that there, may, there might be some, it just depends on what the intention of the question is. Anything else? All right, I think we wanna open it up to questions um, from the audience. So uh, unfortunately, we only have one mic, so if you do have a question, please speak loudly. Sure. Any questions? I have a question. Isn't it a false equivalence to say there's a double standard, given what we know about the research? Is that fair? way to put it? I mean, saying that commenting on a man's appearance um, has the same effect given our cultural biases as commenting on a woman's appearance. They're, they're not the same things, right? That's my... I just want to make sure I understand the question. So you're, you're asking, is it the same? It, it's not the same. Can you repeat, repeat the question? So, so if, for example, we're talking about the, the clearly negative impact on female candidates of mm -hmm. commenting on their appearance. Mm -hmm. When I write about things like that, I get 700 comments of people saying, well, you know, people criticize men's appearances all the time and they're being held to a higher physical standard and they're objectified the same ways. Um, can you comment on that? Because from what I've seen, what I've read, what I understand, um, those are not equivalent things for lots of reasons. We don't have the same systemic problems um, but as writers and as, hmm. as people who've run for office and people advocating, um, how do you respond to those responses to the research? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think in the ca in the example of Chris Christie, uh, you know, the the place that I go to naturally is that I feel like he's the exception. I get that he, you know, you can't you don't have a, a direct comparison, um, though I do too. Go kind of to the place of you could look at you know what what individuals are saying about Hillary Clinton being too old, but for every you know one Chris Christie, I feel like I can point to a hundred you know examples of women's women's appearance being covered because it's the default right does that does that answer the question oh i don't know if so anybody else has a question um this is actually pertaining sort of to what you all were speaking about about a well-intentioned writer that kind of fuels the fire or draws negative light on a candidate sorry um if, if something comes up about their appearance or otherwise. Um, my question is about all of the women's organizations or feminist groups of which I'm a part of many that tend to jump on these as well and draw a lot of attention. Does that do more harm than good? And would it be more in our interest to talk about the policy, the legislative agenda of the woman, et cetera? That's a great question. And actually the research shows that um, third, what we call as third party validators, which name it, change it, in some instances has operated as um, can uh, v validate the candidate's um, qualifications um, but but also call out it is important that they too call out the instance of sexism so it is important in the in the response period that the instance is called out it's called what it is and then you sort of pivot back to why that has no place in you know in the coverage of, of this candidate I actually wanted to follow up on that um, and, sorry, go ahead do you want to follow up oh um, yeah I wanted to direct it to you um, just asking you know, uh, from the writer's perspective, especially if you know if there is a messed up in coverage, you know if there is something you know sexist in the coverage, what is the best way to approach uh, a writer about that? Because um, you know certainly I've gotten a lot of emails where I, a writer is where an emailer is like uh, I, di I didn't care for this coverage, and I'm kind of like okay, well I'm, I'm sorry about that, but um, <laughs> you know I just wanted to talk about how do you approach it in a way that um, maybe the writer will be more receptive to, to that criticism. <laughs> okay, well, 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 I'll sort of talk a little bit about both. One answer just to your question is I agree that actually it is important for these third party groups to call out instances of sexism or places that have, where they feel, whether, whether it's media coverage or an opponent saying something sexist where it's gone wrong, you know, because that's, that's part of what helps educate the public too, to be aware of not only the media bias, because honestly speaking, I think the media is behind the public with respect to women running for office. The public is more, uh, is less likely to pose the questions that, that reporters often pose to these women. Uh, so they need to be reminded of that sometimes. And um, you know, when you have groups like, like Emily's List, for example, which works in a lot of these races, I know we get press releases from them right away when they see something um, that, that is wildly sexist, and I think they do it very effectively. Um, in, in, ter in terms of approaching reporters, uh, I think that, look, I, sometimes we get it wrong, and that's something every reporter will tell you. Uh, the best way to do it is, of course, to do it in a calm, sort of respectful manner. I, I think the thing that's most offensive is when you pick up the phone and someone's shouting at you and cursing at you, and this is something that happens in Washington all too often. So I highly advise against going that route. I think it's, and, and because the reporter might have a defense too. And it's important to have that conversation because we just, we're having a debate right here about, you know, what are the sort of ups and downs of the, within media coverage of women. Maybe sometimes reporters ha have a point to make. Maybe sometimes, you know, they're, they're, they're being biased and they don't realize. So I think the conversation approach is best and then not necessarily telling them how to do their job. That, that happens all too much. It's, it, it, it's best to just kind of talk about, well, I think you could have gone on it from this, at, from this angle, and do you understand you know, my perspective and why this hurts, what kind of damage this could do, and, and that's probably the best way to approach it. I just want to add one other thing is that um, when we look at elected officials, the majority of them are already men. So many of the women are challengers and they don't have the they don't have the long standing um, public records that a reporter can, can you know can lean on to to talk about so i think sometimes there's an a, 
a chance that it could be that the reporter doesn't have enough information, he doesn't understand enough about the background of the person and isn't asking really some, you know, delving deeply. He might perhaps, he or she might actually see um, that the, the person who's in office, they want to keep them in office for a variety of reasons. Um, there are a lot of editorials um, as opposed to solid reporters. And I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that sometimes someone comes with an agenda. Um, when we had our Washington Post um, editorial interviews, I spent less than three minutes on the phone with, with, with um, the editorial board. It was so clear to me that he'd already made up his mind about who they were going to be supporting that I finally said, okay, I get that you're not going to be with me no matter what I say. So let's talk about an important issue that's going on in Virginia that I want to make sure gets some, some attention and coverage. Has nothing to do with me because I can tell that you don't, you don't, you're not interested in who I am. And in the editorial um, endorsement, they went on a, a full paragraph about my, my opponent who has done a lot in the, in in his tenure, and at the bottom it said, and Jennifer Boisco, a Democratic activist, is no match, basically. So. Oh, so, one minute, sorry. So I think we're, we're touching on some really key things here about the fact that women are fairly new to this political arena. If you look at every legislature, you look at Capitol Hill, men have dominated this for hundreds of years. And so women are, new to this and we've got women in media who are also new to this because women in journalism is also not hundreds of years old. So everybody is kind of finding their way and I think we all need to give ourselves and each other a break that we do not, you know, every time I hear the people in Virginia talk about Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson, I could spit. You know, they acted like they, they, they settled the new world without any women at all. Like, I don't know where the women were. They weren't in Jamestown. They weren't on the Mayflower. I don't know. Men came. They settled it. They made everything great for the rest of us. Aren't we? It's marvelous to be the, the beneficiaries of such benevolent patriarchy. But that exists, and that's kind of the bias that I talk about being the operating system in people's head, whether they realize it or not. When you've got somebody saying that our founding fathers are the, the pinnacle and the aspiration, that does not leave a place for us. And so we have to create figures for ourselves. I just finished watching season two of uh, House of Cards. Oh. And the thing no I will spoilers. say about House of Cards. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no spoilers. No spoilers. But what I'm going to tell you is it, it portrays people. If you think about West Wing, if you think about, if you think about pop culture and how they're trying to draw women characters, this is new. And books and television shows and everything actually help to create people's perception where there's a huge vacuum where only men have been. So I think we are finding our ways as women candidates and as journalists to try to draw a fair and balanced picture, but we need to give ourselves a break because we're just not there yet. We mm -hmm. just don't have the experience to draw on. And I, I think it's important you mentioned, I kind of want to respond to that simply because I get asked this question all the time as a Hill reporter now that people watch House of Cards. Is that what it's like? Is that what your job is like? And I'm like, no, not at all. And, and you know, I actually, we had the co-creator on HuffPost Live, our online TV network, and, you know, this is where I was called in as sort of to talk about my experience. And I, I kind of told him to his face, he did not take to it too kindly, but I, I said, you know, one of the things that I think is unfortunate is that Hollywood has a stereotype for female journalists and they are always over-sexualized and it is always this angle, the storyline is always sensational. She's sleeping around with her sources and that's how she gets where she gets. Just the other day, uh, Robin Wright, who of course plays uh, Claire Underwood, said, you know, well, women do sleep with sources. I've heard it from the White House too. And look, no one is saying that there might not be some people somewhere on both sides, men and women alike, who may date each other or who may engage in w whatever relations they want to. But I think it's, it belittles not only the, it belittles women as well as their, the profession to imply that that is all that they do, that that's the way that women get ahead in this business. When I can personally, I think, vouch for every woman Hill reporter I know to say that I, that's not how they do their work. They do it with a great amount of dignity. And you're right, though. What I realized in that conversation was I've, I've done my part, I've expressed my opinion, but actually we're not there yet because he really doesn't understand what I'm saying. I, you know, he said, he said, look, he, his response was, you know, well, Zoe Barnes is not a good reporter. She's bad at her job. And I said, she's, she becomes a superstar in your first, in your TV show, like overnight and, you know, is heralded as like the biggest reporter in town now. So I don't know if I agree with that assessment. Um, 
And, and anyhow, I, I think that, like you said, in some ways, there are more inroads that just have to be made. Um, and you're right, it's not just on the side of, pol of the campaigns, it's on the side of the media, too. That showed up in, I was just gonna say the same creator um, also did Ides of March, and that was a similar theme in that same, uh, in that same film. I think there's another question in the back. And then one more over here. Hi, thank you, first of all, for having this discussion. It's really uh, engaging. I actually um, work on the individual level with professional and personal coaching and development from women across the city and across the country and across industries. And one thing we keep getting is that even though we at Bossed Up tend to focus on purpose over perception and empowering women to really not overinvest in one's appearance, we continue to get requests for personal appearance coaching and makeover coaching and color matching um, and, and the like. So my question is really, how do we empower women to become the next Rosa DeLauro? How do we explain and create an environment both in the political realm and with the help of the media to say, do you, be you, um, and run for office that way? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And I think, one, the media can can make a choice to stop focusing on the way a woman looks um, when it's not relevant to to um, to the policy. But also, as we you know, as we move forward, we're going to have more role models, more women who are are showing other people the way. Um, I, as I said, I'm a mother of two daughters, and and. Um, one is in high school and the other mothers and the daughters and some of the, the boys too are all like, wow, a, a mother at our school can run for, for, for House of Delegates. I never imagined that, you know. We sit at the field hockey games together. So changing their perspective, it, it's not going to happen overnight though. I mean, um, this is going to take a long time, but it, it's an, an, an incremental thing, and we have to be strong, and we have to stand up, and just like we were talking about, if somebody says something that doesn't match, we have to hold them on it and then get back to saying, but did I tell you about what my education platform is? Because that's really why I'm here today, and just continue to pivot back, just like just like Aaron was telling us. The only thing that I would add to that is, um, you know, this is tricky in the candidate space, uh, really tricky, because you look at the major institutional players, and they most definitely advise candidate women candidates to look the part, if you will, which pretty much means, you know, look like your ma your male counterparts. Um, and um, what I would say, I think I would echo what Jennifer says to that, which is, you know, we just have to get, we just have to get more women in office because the, the more that it, it, it becomes of a variety as opposed to a type, um, we, we have other examples to point to and what is most important coming out of that is that, um, and I think this, this, this would apply to, to all industries is that you know a woman will stand up for herself, a woman will be confident, a woman and and that will all rise above the is she playing the you know the, the traditional appearance role. Hi. Um, so we've been talking very broadly about women, and I'm uh, interested to see what y'all think about media coverage of um, women of color, because if you think about it, there's only like there's only been one African American female senator ever. I don't think there's ever been a Latina senator. Uh, Grace Meng is like one of the only like Asian American uh, representatives uh, who's a woman. So just you know, my impression is that women of color have when they're talking about their lived experiences, it's sort of, it can be hard to separate race from gender. And I'm wondering if y'all see that playing out uh, in terms of media coverage, and if so, how? Um, well, I think that actually it, it, it's kind of been interesting for me because as you mentioned, there, there are so few uh, women lawmakers, uh, elected women law officials who are of who are minorities and and who are women of color who, and and part of the th problem that I see is often we don't, as, as the media, the, I think the main um, mistake I would call it that I've seen is that they don't even cover a lot of these women to begin with. They don't get the same spotlight, and so that within and of itself is a problem. Is you know when when the uh, when editors ask, well, what's the story here? The story is that you know they're part of the reason why again when we talk about role models and what influence that has on other women who might be thinking about running, who think that maybe they can't because they don't even 
um, see many examples before them, uh, it come, I think the, me the media can play a role in sort of at least highlighting the fact that there are a lot of women of color and, and you look at the book or there are some and here, here's what they're working on, here's what they're achieving, um, here's how they got to where they are. Uh, I know, you know, I did an interview recently with Nina Turner, who's running for Secretary of State in Ohio, and she's just a fantastic candidate, um, very engaging, and very willing, though, to talk about her personal experience. Um, and, you know, she, she, so she does, she is willing to say, you know, vote, the issue of voting rights, which, of course, as a Secretary of, of State candidate in Ohio, is particularly important to her because of a lot of the voter suppression tactics that we're seeing across the country, um, and, and, and in particular, of course, trying to uh, suppress minority turnout. And, and she's sort of willing to take her own background and her own experience and directly apply that. Um, and, and I think the way, the best way for the media to approach it is, is to make sure that they aren't trying to tie race where it's, again, it comes to relevance. There, there's, you don't have to tie someone's race to their profile or their story unless it's something that they want to address and that they want to openly talk about. You know, another woman, Tulsi Gabbard, who's the first Hindu elected to Congress, um, you know, I know she, she did one story about it and then she wanted, I think the sense was to put it to rest. It's okay to have that one piece about, you know, here's the first Hindu elected to Congress, and now let's talk about the work she's going to do in Congress because the, that's not the defining, I think, moment of to her. That's not what how she wants to define her political career. Um, I. I think one way, again, as we look at our biases, um, I worked for Howard Dean when he was running for president back in 2003, and he used to always, um, when he was out talking to people, talk about when he was choosing his staff, at first, everybody looked like him. They were all white men. And he made a conscious decision to say, let's find some people who have some different backgrounds, who have a different perspective. And he selectively went out and made sure that he found highly qualified folks who looked different than him, women, women of color, gay people, um, Latinas, so that he, you know, when, when you are in the media and you're only talking to white men, for instance, you might want to think, hmm, am I just picking the person who looks like me the most? And then make an effort to go out and, and reach out to someone else. When um, the candidates this past year for that, and I, I keep talking about this because I've just gone through this, but the candidates who were targeted by our Democratic caucus, there were 25, 25 women, 12 of us were, were challengers, um, and not one of our races were targeted by the caucus. Were we less qualified than the other people? I, I can't say that we weren't. But it was men who were making those choices. And um, again, we have to look at our biases. Um, there were lots of good people who didn't get the attention that I think they deserved. <coughs> I've heard Nina Turner um, speak a number of times. And once, once she was uh, sharing her personal experience of um, just how difficult it is um, for her as a role model, a woman of color in a, you know, in a public role to, um, to look even at, you know, if you look at the, the Sunday talk shows, you know, she said, talk about, talk about being left out, you know, yes, women are not represented, but a woman of color? really not represented and and so i think you know you look to you look there you look you know back to our conversation about the importance of pop culture um and you know how are, are we are we diversifying what you know what our women look like for different different roles in you know in in uh, in in TV shows and movies, et cetera, and how can we, how can we as people who are making the time to, to talk about this, um, push harder to demand that we see more role models? Um, and, you know, that can happen through, I think, you know, our, our, our piece, our, you know, topic tonight and, you know, who we're covering um, in stories, but I think it, I think it goes beyond that too. Yeah, I think that's a, okay. <laughs> I think that's a great point and just shows how intertwined media coverage is with the institutional uh, diversity problems within politics that, you know, certainly, you know, if you're a reporter, your sources, you can't really help who your sources are because you're going to the staffs of, you know, Harry Reid's office and whoever's office and, you know, if there isn't diversity there, it becomes much, much harder to add diversity into your story. Um, so it just goes to show that, the, that there's so much, you know, institutional bias across the board and and to to really change the media picture there needs to be change on all of those fronts Can I add a point to that though 
Um, as somebody who's uh, worked on the campaign trail, I, you know, in the piece of diversifying sources, what I would say is, um, you know, like everywhere else, we have a, 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 a small number of um, women political consultants um, who are out front, um, who are sort of, you know, the ones who are often going to be pushed to the front. You're gonna, you're gonna most often get to the men on the campaigns as your source. You're going to find them more easily. Um, but the women are there. Just, you know, it's not like they are. We don't have women in politics. There are quality sources that are there, and you have to push hard and you have to ask for them. They are often not raising their hands the same way that the men are. And it is upon us, I think, to really say, okay, that's great. I have your perspective. Is there somebody else that I can speak with? Do you have a woman on the staff that I can speak with? I think it's important to do. Great. Um, well, I, I think that wraps everything up. Um, we are going to introduce someone who can help you with these uh, issues as you move forward. But I just want to thank everyone for coming. And maybe the panel can stick around if uh, folks have other questions yeah. afterward. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to, yeah. And thank you for the work you're all doing. And I'm going to hand this over to Rachel Laris, who does amazing work at the Women's Media Center and Name It Change It. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm Rachel Laris. I'm the communications manager of the Women's Media Center, and I'm here with my colleague Kate McCarthy, who is the director of SheSource. And um, Women's Media Center was really proud to be the media partner with She Should Run on our Name It Change It research, our Name It Change It project, and our Name It Change It research, where we were talking about the appearance research. And one of the tools that I brought tonight was the Name It Change It media guide for gender neutral coverage of women candidates and politicians. Um, because one of the things that I wanted to talk about that sort of didn't come up uh, with the panel was we've been talking about appearance coverage, but it's also about words, um, about words used to describe women candidates. Um, one incident that we detailed at Aim It Change It was there was a morning edition story about Kirsten Gillibrand. And this was a positive story, and the, but the way that they described her was with a, she had a, uh, was it a whiny or was it a high pitched, uh, Perky and girly, and she had a high-pitched voice. And they also talked about how beautiful she was. And I spoke to um, the editor of that story, and I said, like, where did this come from? And she says, well, first of all, they took that out right away. They, they kind of got called out on using that term as being very gendered, and they just pulled it. But they left in all the stuff about her being called beautiful. And the reporter said that she, or actually the editor said that the reporter had gone around, and this is what everyone mentioned about Kristen Gillibrand. And the one thing that I want to say is that as a reporter, you might encounter your own sources sort of talking about the women candidates and sexist ways. They may actually think that it's, it's oh, Kirsten Gillibrand, she's so beautiful. You want to talk about this. And so, but the problem is, is that according to our research, and I can kind of see this, I think that it triggers something in the voters. They don't like it. And the respect for the women candidates goes down the more you talk about how beautiful they are. I don't know why this is. Um, I suspect that it's because it's triggering something like, oh, she wants to be called beautiful and she's vain and there's something about this that the voters don't like. Men don't have this issue very often. So one of the things that um, Women's Media Center founder Gloria Steinem has, and we've talked about in Name and Change It, is the rule of reversibility, which is before you use this language or this term or the story frame, think about if you would use this on a male candidate. So I think about this in terms of terms like perky and spunky and feisty and whiny. Very often these are adjectives that are not used for men. And so we have a list of these words in the Name It, Change It uh, media guide. And it's just something that I often, when I talk to reporters, when I talk to editors, I just talk about stories being gendered. I try gendered sometimes because that works better than sexist because people, you call people sexist and they immediately react with, uh, with um, with defensiveness, so sometimes I talk about, well, the language is very gendered. And so I've also had editors say, well, what's wrong with it being gendered? So that's why the research is really important. So I have a bunch of these, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about sort of what, what everyone can do in terms of calling out. So thank you so much. And by the way, thank, thank you so much for convening this panel. I think this was really, really important. Absolutely, and thank you, Rachel. That's a great resource, and folks should definitely use it. All right, thank you. Have a good evening.